Have you ever been in a situation, right, where perhaps you needed help, or you were in need of help, but nobody noticed? Nobody noticed that you needed help. You ever been in that situation? The, the place I experienced this the most, I don't know if any of you relate, but the place that I experienced this the most is at the Home Depot. I experienced it there all the time. Uh, some of the most unhelpful people work at the Home Depot. Okay, I'm sorry if you work there or if you know somebody that does. I'm just, I'm just saying my experience, okay? Some of the most unhelpful. It, I think one of the interview questions that they ask if you interview for Home Depot is, do you hate helping people? And if you say yes, you're hired on the spot, right? That, that's been my experience. You know, you, we've all been in that situation, right? The store, when you go to Home Depot, it's a big store. It's huge. And it's impossible to find what you need. And the people that work there, man, they're walking like they got somewhere to be. And no one is willing to stop and lend a hand. Not even ask you, right, if you need help. I, I, and, and you stand there, right? You're there standing. You're standing between the toilet seat and the screwdriver, wondering which one of these Godzilla-sized aisles has the light bulbs, right? And you have no idea where to find. It's like you need a map with, bre with breadcrumbs, right, to get around Home Depot. It's very difficult, and nobody sees you. So you just shed a tear quietly by yourself in the middle of the Home Depot. And as your problem is unseen by every orange apron wearing jerk in that store, right? And they just walk past you. Nobody cares because they can't see your problem. They can't see it. You know, we all have blind spots. We all have blind spots. We all have problems seeing certain things sometimes. Ain't that right? We all have a hard time. We all have a difficulty seeing things sometimes because we can get so used to viewing a problem that eventually we grow blind to it. We're unable to see it. For example, in my living room, if you guys came to my living room, I have three bulbs in the living room that lights it up. Uh, one of the bulbs went out, and so I went to the store and I replaced it. It's, it's a weird bulb. It's not like your normal screw-in bulb. It's another one. I just went to the hardware store, bought one, brought it back, and I screwed it in. But the bulb that they gave me was dimmer and warmer than all the other lights. So it's less potent and it's like a yellow light instead of the white lights in there. At first, when I put it up, it was such a stark contrast. And, and it stood out to me so drastically. It was like, oh, this is ugly. You got two different color lights here and, you know, I better buy another one ASAP. But guess what? Over time, if you don't replace it, you lose sight of the problem. You get used to it. You learn to live with it. But if you guys came to my living room and I turn on the lights, you would notice it right away. You'd be like, Danny, why is one light yellow, one, white, one light white? Why is this one brighter than that one? You would notice it right away. Now, when it comes to our spiritual walk, we can also grow blind. We can grow blind and numb to the lostness in our community. And we can wake up each day like a Home Depot employee, walking past friends, walking past family, walking past neighbors that are in desperate need of Jesus, but in completely ignoring the hurt and the lack of hope. Are you blind today? Are, are your eyes closed to the needs and the opportunities that are around you to change your world, to introduce Jesus to someone, to connect and to build a relationship with someone, to lead someone into finding God and finding life. Are you blind to that? You know what's the first thing I reach for when I wake up in the morning? Anybody can take a guess? I need my glasses. That's the first thing before I get out of my bed. I, I reach out, I grab my glasses, I put it on. Before I even step foot off my bed, I need my glasses. I need it. I catch some of you guys that wear glasses. I catch you, and, and you don't have them on when you're outside, right? And I say, hey, where's your glasses? Oops, I forgot. I left them at home, <laughs> right? That means you don't really need them. If you forget your glasses, you know what happens if I leave the house without my glasses? I die, right? I'll die. You know what else will happen? You all will die. If I'm driving without my I will literally run you over. I need my glasses. I desperately need them. Without my glasses, it's extremely difficult for me to see or notice anything. Yet, many of us are blind spiritually and unable to see the needs that are right under our noses. And if we want God to use us to change our world, then we need to beg Him 
to open our eyes. You know, in all four Gospels and the book of Acts, in all four Gospels and the book of Acts, in Jesus' own words, he commands us to go and make disciples. To go, go. In different ways, he says that all four Gospels and the books, book of Acts, he tells us to share the good news of Jesus with everyone in the world. In all four Gospels and the book of Acts, Jesus reminds us that he did not die and conquer death for a church gathering, but for a church going. That's what Jesus gave up his life for. And this is what we're constantly reminded throughout the scriptures, that we are not to be seated, but to be sent. But here's the thing, and you can write this down in your notes. We cannot reach what we cannot see. We cannot reach what we cannot see. You guys remember the story of the Samaritan woman by the well? You guys know that story. It's a very well-known story in the New Testament. Jesus is crossing through uh, the town of Samaria, when he encounters this woman. Now, what you need to know about this is that the Jews and the Samaritans, they did not get along, right? They did not relate to each other at all. There was a lot of animosity between those two people groups, between the Jewish and the Samaritans. Most Jews would go around Samaria, but Jesus goes through Samaria. Here's why, because Jesus is for all people. And along his journey, he's tired, He's thirsty, so he sits down by a well. And the disciples at this point, you know, they get hungry, so they go looking for like the closest Popeyes or whatever, and they, they walk away, they leave Jesus by himself, and a Samaritan woman comes to draw water from the well, and Jesus asks her for a drink. This one question, would you give me a drink? It, it opens up a dialogue for them too that would forever change the life of this woman. You see, the woman that came to the well when Jesus was there was a notorious adulterer. She would have been overlooked by everybody else. She was ignored by the religious people, but not Jesus, because Jesus saw her. And he goes on to share how he can offer her living water, that she could experience God's perfect love and acceptance and forgiveness that she wouldn't have to seek love and approval from other men jumping from bed to bed in search of meaning and purpose, for sure getting her heart broken and being taken advantage of over and over again. Jesus said, you don't need to go through all that. And this life-transforming conversation is happening when the disciples come back with their happy meals, right? They come back with their lunches and they see Jesus by himself with this lady, the Samaritan woman, and they're having this profound deep, spiritual, life transformative conversation. And then this happens. In, uh, this is in the book of John, chapter 4, verse 27. You have it there in your notes. Verse 27 says this. Just then, his disciples arrive. Right? They, came, they come back from KFC, and they're, they're amazed that he was talking with a woman. You would think, Jesus, are you okay? Do you need help with anything? Can we get you anything? What, what's going on? It says, yet yeah, no one said, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? So just come back. They completely missed it. Verse 28. Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they left the town and made their way to him. So this woman has this life-transformative conversation with Jesus. She's excited about it. She goes running back home to tell all her friends, her neighbors, her family, hey, I found the Messiah. You got to meet him. You got to talk to him. You got to see him. And then in verse 31, in the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. Before your chicken nuggets, they get cold. You know, we brought it. We came all the way from, from over here. We got it for you, Rabbi. Eat something. And then he answers them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples, right, are, are kind of like us. They're, they're like, it's right over their heads. They're not, they're not understanding what's going on here. And in verse 33, this is what they, they scratch their heads. They said to one another, could someone else have brought them something to, to eat? They're, they're like completely, they're missing it all together. And then verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told them. What he's telling them is that, you know what's more important than food is this conf conf uh, conversation that I'm having with this woman. 
and this life transformation that is happening inside of her as a light bulb is going off in her head and she's recognizing that I am the way, the truth, and the life and this is more important than whatever else you're focusing on. You guys need to focus on it, but you're missing it is what he's telling them. Verse 35, don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Say these three words with me. Ready, go. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. Would you guys put an underline right there on those three words, open your eyes, or box that there in your notes? The disciples missed it entirely. They were focused on, on their eating and, 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 and maybe even trying to be a good friend to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, you know, we brought this from you. Make sure you eat it. Come on, like, you know, completely missing the opportunity that was before them. And Jesus says, open your eyes. Look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. Guys, do you think that it is possible that just maybe, just maybe that we might be more like the disciples than we care to admit? What if we're oblivious to the needs and opportunities that are around us? What if we're walking around with our spiritual eyes closed? So for the rest of our time, I want us to look at a few ways that we must open our eyes. Okay, number one, write this down. We need to open our eyes to where they are. We need to open our eyes to where they are. Here's what I need everybody in this room to understand. I need you guys to get this, that you are not here by accident. That no matter how you made it to this city or to this neighborhood or to this church and to this very moment, you are not here by mistake. Maybe you had different plans. You had different dreams, ulterior motives. You had aspirations. But God, in his sovereignty, brought you to this moment right here. And you're not here by mistake. And if you realize that, then you'll begin to notice that right here, right now, God has placed people around you and he has brought you to them in order for you to add value to them, to build, to connect, and to ultimately show and share the love of Jesus with them. I love what the book of Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 says. I would love for you guys to read this verse out loud with me. It's in your notes and on the screen. Ready, go. A person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. In other words, sometimes we think we got it all figured out. We think we got our plan, but at the end of the day, it's God who's doing the leading and the guiding and determining our steps. You know, sometimes we wrongly think that we need to be on a trip to a foreign country, right, to find the people that God has called us to, or that we need to do a specific outreach and a specific ministry opportunity in order to do that. But the truth is that the Lord is determining your steps, and he has sovereignly placed you where you are, surrounded by the people that you are, so that you can make a difference. So where are those that God has called you to? They're on your block. They're in your building. They're in your office. They're sitting across from you at the coffee shop. They're at the park with their kids. They're right here, right around you, right now. Here's the second place we need to open our eyes. Here's the second thing we need to do. We need to open our eyes to who they are. We need to open our eyes to who they are. You know, we all have a certain lens on how we view other people. We might find others annoying. Maybe you find others disgusting or nuisance or helpless or lost cause or damaged goods. And when we have that lens and that perspective of people, it drastically changes how we view them and how we treat them. Friday, I, I took the family to, uh, to Playland, and in the middle of this place, right, where there's supposed to be so much fun, and there's supposed to be so much families, a fun, safe place for children and families, I saw nearly two fights break out in the middle of the park. I'm talking about some heated arguments. Why? Because of the perspective that people are walking around with. Some of us walk around looking at other people like they're our enemy. Like there's, like there's always someone out there to get you. And because of that perspective, it prevents you from developing a love for others and taking advantage of those God-given opportunities to add value. And instead, you walk around getting into fights and always looking for an argument. But you need to understand that other people 
those people God has called you to live amongst, He's called you to live among them and to faithfully demonstrate and proclaim the gospel to they're not your enemy. I want you guys to look at Jesus' viewpoint on people. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, look at what it says about Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he felt what? What's that word, Swerve? He felt compassion for them. He wasn't disgusted. He wasn't annoyed. He wasn't angry. When he looked at the people, his neighbors, his pe the people that were around him, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. You see, guys, Jesus had a different perspective on people. His perspective on people compelled him to a place of compassion. His heart broke for the people in his community, the people that he was called to serve, the people that he would ultimately give his life for. What if we had that perspective on the people that God has called us to, to the people right around us? Instead of feeling disgust or irritation, what if we had compassion? the people he has called us to serve? What if we allowed God to break and to mold our hearts to be more like Jesus? Then perhaps we wouldn't view people as projects, but as precious. Maybe we wouldn't see people as annoying, but with the potential for the Holy Spirit's anointing. Maybe we wouldn't see people as disgusting, but as people in desperate need of the grace of God, just as we are. And here's the last thing, number three. We need to open our eyes to what they need. So there's two sides that often comes to this, what Christians believe about what people, about what people with Jesus need. Right? There's two different kind of camps or two different sides. Some think that people need truth. They need all the truth. They need to hear that they're, they're heading to hell without Jesus. And if they got hit by a bus today, then they're going to spend eternity away from Jesus. These people often hold signs that say, repent, you know, churn and burn, or you're going to hell, right? They usually have a frown and they're not, you know, very happy people. And a lot of people don't like them. But then you have the people that say it's all grace. It's all about grace. It doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you do. You got grace, 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 grace. Right? There's two different sides, oftentimes in Christianity. However, both of these views are radically different from how Jesus fulfilled his ministry during his time here on earth. Check out how John describes Jesus in his gospel. In John chapter 1, verse 14, look at what it says. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, talking about Jesus, the Word. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of what? Full of grace and... He was full of grace and truth. He wasn't one or the other. Jesus was full of both. And if we want to be effective in changing our world and leading people to Jesus, then we need to open our eyes to what others need. And what our friends and what our neighbors and what our families need is grace and truth. They need to know about their sinfulness and their inability to save themselves, but also to hear about the forgiveness and grace that's made available through Jesus. I came across this quote this week. This quote is from Tim Keller. It's not in your notes, but it is on the screen. I want to read it to you guys. This is what he says. He says, love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us, but keeps us in denial about our flaws. Truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it. God's saving love in Christ, however, is marked by both radical truthfulness about who we are, and yet also radical, yet also radical unconditional commitment to us. The merciful commitment strengthens us to see the truth about ourselves, and repent. The conviction and repentance moves us to cling to and rest in God's mercy and grace. You know, this idea of truth and grace perhaps is best, in, in, uh, best illustrated in the story of a man named Zacchaeus in the New Testament. We'll call him Zach for short. Zach was a, a tax collector, and he was a bad guy. Nobody liked Zach. Other people did not like this guy because he was a thief. You see, tax collectors in Jesus' day, not only would they collect money 
from the Jews for the opposing government. They were collecting money for the Roman government. But tax collectors would also charge extra to benefit their own pockets. Right, so they would go around stealing money from their own people. So nobody liked this guy. And one day Jesus is walking through Jericho and a crowd begins to form. No doubt Jesus is ministering to the needs of the people, you know, healing the sick and preaching and serving and teaching. And Zacchaeus is a part of the crowd that day. Um, and he wants to see what this Jesus guy is all about. But the Bible gives us this detail, this information. It says that he's too short. And he's surrounded by all these people. He can't see Jesus. So he says, well, I want to see this guy. And he climbs up a tree to see Jesus. And I bet you everybody else missed out on Zach. Because he was short. They probably saw over him. And then when he climbed up into the tree, he was too high up. And people ignored him. People walked past him, but guess who saw him? Because Jesus walked around with his eyes open. He sees Zach. He sees Zacchaeus in the tree, and he doesn't despise him. He doesn't reject him, and he doesn't even embarrass him in front of everybody. And he doesn't air out his dirty laundry. What does Jesus do? He walks up to Zacchaeus in the tree, and he says, Hey, you want to go have some lunch? Let's go grab some lunch. You see, Jesus knew that by adding value and by building a relationship over a meal, he would be able to get through to him. He began with grace. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't tell us what exactly went down during that lunch. It doesn't tell us exactly what he said, but we do know what was the result of Jesus' visit. In Luke chapter 19, verse 8 and 9, look at what it says. This is amazing. But Zacchaeus stood there and he said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. And then Jesus looks at Zach and looks at the crowd. And he says, Today salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And whenever he approached others with this grace and truth, one thing was certain. There was life transformation that took place. People's lives were changed, radically changed. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And if we want to see people come to know Jesus, if we want to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ, that we need to ask God to show us what our neighbors need. And what they need is both grace and truth. So I want to invite you guys. Let's be people full of grace and truth. And let's ask God to open our eyes to the needs right around us. Let's pray. God, I'll just pray today, God, that you would open our spiritual eyes to see where they are. God, to recognize that the harvest, that to recognize that the people that you sent Jesus to die for and the, the people that you've called us to communicate the truth of the gospel to, Father, are right around us. They're in our workplace. They're at our schools. They're in our coffee shops. God, they're right around us in the park. So give us eyes to see where they are. God, I pray you would open our eyes to who they are. God, that we wouldn't see people, um, God, just by looking at their exterior and judging them by what we see on the outside. But instead, like Christ, we may look at others with compassion and love. So fill us, God, with that love and compassion. And God, I pray you would open our eyes to see what they need. God, I pray you would help us to be full of grace and truth. God, that we wouldn't stick to one side or the other. Father, that we would be full of grace and truth as Christ was. And that we would demonstrate that to our friends, family, and neighbors, and to others, God. God, you've given us a great calling. You've commissioned us, God. And this calling, this commissioning is not for us to sit down Lord, in, in warm pews or seats, 
God, it is to make a difference. And so, God, I speak, uh, Lord, to everyone in this room. God, I pray over everyone in this room, God, that you would help us see that we are difference makers, God, that you have called us to make difference, a difference in our life, in the lives of those that are around us, God, that we would see ourselves as commissioned to do what you've called us to. So help us, God. The harvest is plentiful. The labors are few, God. So pray, God, that right in this room, you would raise up people in this room, God, to go forth and share the truth of the gospel and to see people come to know you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.